I'm going to be going over a really basic introduction to synthetic aperture radar data. So a few of the basic concepts of synthetic aperture radar are that they, are, they make use of the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So these wavelengths are longer than infrared, but shorter than radio waves. It's an active sensing system, which means that there's a very controlled pulse that's sent, sent out from the sensor, and only the returns that come back of those controlled pulses are measured. And lastly, it has a side-looking geometry, so it's always imaging the Earth at an oblique angle. And this is really important to be aware of, because while it's necessary for processing the data, it also means that there are certain distortions that are inherent to SAR data sets that you need to be aware of and often correct for before you can make use of the data. People often ask, what is synthetic about SAR? And basically, if you wanted to use radar to image the Earth's surface, you would have to have an incredibly long antenna if you were going to be imaging from space. And it's just not practical to have an antenna that long attached to a satellite. So in order to make it possible to get reasonable resolution when imaging the Earth with radar, we actually make use of the movement of the sensor as a proxy for a much longer antenna. And so through data processing, we can get a resolution that you would expect from a very long antenna but actually using a shorter antenna that's actually possible to attach to a satellite. Some of the benefits of SAR are that it can penetrate cloud cover. This means that you're able to collect imagery of the Earth's surface when there are clouds or smoke, and also when there are areas that have frequent cloud cover. So imaging during hurricanes or wildfires or in areas where there is just a lot of cloud cover in general, such as equatorial regions or in southwest Alaska, where you have very few cloud-free days. And so it can be very difficult to put together a time series with optical data. SAR is not sensitive to light availability. Because it is an active sensor, it creates its own illumination. So it, it doesn't have to be timed with, with daylight hours. It can collect data anytime, anywhere. With the addition of SAR sensors to satellite platforms, there is now global coverage with SAR data, and newer constellations have really frequent and regular imaging that allow for very stable long-term data sets that have a fairly dense time series stacking. SAR can collect data using different polarizations, and different polarizations tell you different things about the surface of the Earth. There may be just single pole sensors, and that means that it can only send and receive in one polarization. So if it sends vertical signals, it can only receive signals that are still vertically polarized. Conversely, it may be able to send out and receive just in horizontal. Many sensors are dual pole, which means they can still send out only in one polarization, but it can receive in both that same co-polarization, but also the cross-polarized returns. So if it sends out a vertically polarized signal, it can measure both the vertical returns and also the cross-polarized horizontal returns. So that gives you VV and VH. Similarly, it may be able to collect uh, the HH and the HV if it's sending out as uh, the, the signal in a horizontal polarization. In some cases, even though it can only uh, send out in one polarization, it may be able to switch modes depending on where it is. For example, Sentinel-1 tends to collect with vertical polarization as the primary polarization over land, but over the oceans it switches so that most of the imagery collected over oceans have horizontal polarization as the primary polarization. There are also sensors that are full quad pole sensors, and this means that they can send and receive in both polarizations. And so it, you get the HH, the HV, the VH, and the VV, which gives you a lot of information about the Earth's surface. And you can combine them in different ways and, and really kind of tease out some of the things that are happening on Earth. Unfortunately, it's a very expensive way to collect data. There's a lot of information coming back. And so often there are trade-offs in terms of when quad pole data is available, it may mean that the, the beam is, is smaller, so the images are, are smaller and you don't 
capture as much of the Earth's surface with, with each pass. But when you do have access to quadpole data, it's a very powerful data set. Lastly, SAR is sensitive to very small changes in elevation on the Earth's surface. And this makes it an excellent tool for measuring small deformations or large deformations that occur as a result of uh, earthquakes or volcanoes or even human interactions with the Earth's surface, things that change the elevation. There are two components to the SAR data set, amplitude and phase. The amplitude is the amount of signal that is returned to the sensor, often called radar backscatter. The backscatter measurements are impacted by both the physical properties and the dielectric properties of the targets on Earth. The different polarizations interact different, differently with, with physical characteristics on the Earth. For example, VV returns are sensitive mostly to surface roughness. And so if you have a very rough surface, it will have a higher amount of radar backscatter in the VV polarization. VH is more sensitive to volume scattering. A common volume scatterer on Earth is vegetation, especially uh, forests and, and canopy areas where the, there is the possibility of interaction with this complex volume where the polarization can get turned around. So the, it, it's depolarized from its original send polarization and comes back in the cross polarized direction. So the other thing to be aware of, however, is the dielectric properties of the, of the targets that the wave is interacting with. Dielectric constant indicates the amount of permittivity of an object. So if it has a high dielectric constant, it reflects a lot of the signal, whereas targets with lower dielectric properties are able to absorb more of the signal. So there's less potential for it be, to be sent back to the sensor. So let's take a look at some of this data in action. The images were collected with Sentinel-1 over the North Slope of Alaska, which is a very flat area with lots of lakes, and it can be prone to, to strong winds. On the top row are the VV returns. And if you look at the image that was collected on a calm day, you can see that the water shows up very clearly in distinction from the land around it as very dark returns. And this is because these lakes on a calm day are very smooth and, um, and flat, and water has a high dielectric constant. So when the signal hits that surface, it bounces off and goes off in the other direction. It doesn't, very little, if any of that signal comes back to the sensor to be, to be measured. On a windy day, however, the surface of the water becomes rough from that wind and wave action. And so some of the signals may be sent actually back in the direction they came from. So if you look at that image in the top right corner, you can see that it's actually quite difficult to tell the difference between the lakes and the surrounding tundra. On the bottom row, you have the VH returns from those same acquisitions. And you can see that there's really not much difference on the windy day versus the calm day. And this is because even though the, the surface is rough, it's still a surface, so it's, there's not, there aren't the mechanisms to depolarize that signal. So any of the returns that are coming back from that water are generally still in the vertical polarization. So the VH returns are still quite low over the water. Another thing to be aware of when working with SAR data is that it, the microwave spectrum is quite wide and there are different bands that are commonly used within that spectrum to collect SAR data. So for some of the larger uh, satellite borne missions, C band and L band are commonly used. C band is, has a wavelength of about five or six centimeters. And so if, if you're imaging over a canopy, for example, if there's a dense forest that has broadleaf trees with, with quite large leaves, the ability of that signal to penetrate very deeply is low. So it won't make it very far into the canopy before all of that signal is scattered. So the returns that you're getting from a C-band sensor over dense vegetation are probably indicative of, of the conditions fairly high up in the canopy, 
if you're using an L-band sensor, it has a much longer wavelength on the order of 24 or 25 centimeters. I'm, I'm getting some noise. If everyone can please mute if you're not presenting. So the L-bands uh, wavelengths are much longer, which means that they can penetrate much further through the canopy. And you may actually be getting returns from either the forest floor or objects that are below the canopy itself. So if you're comparing data sets, you want to make sure that you're comparing data that was collected with the same wavelength. If you look at C-band data and you're comparing it historically with, with L-band data, you are comparing two different things. On the other hand, if you have access to both C-band and L-band data from the same time period, it, it means that it can expand your understanding of what's going on throughout that, that column of the, of the profile of the vegetation, because the C-band is indicating what's going on higher up, whereas the L-band allows you to see through the foliage much better. The same thing is true over bare soil. An L-band sensor will penetrate more deeply into the soil and be giving you information about the conditions deeper down than, than a C-band sensor. As I mentioned, there are distortions that are present due to that side-looking acquisition of the data set. So if, you're, if you want to use amplitude data, in most cases, you need to perform radiometric terrain correction to make it useful. If you look at the image on the left, you can see that the mountains outside Juneau, Alaska all kind of look like they're squashed over and they have really bright leading edges. And if you're, if you're imaging a mountain from the side, if, if your incident angle of the, of the signal is perpendicular to that slope, all of the returns or many of the returns from both the base and the top of the mountain might be coming back to the sensor at the same time which the sensor then interprets as being all from the same place on Earth. Whereas if you were looking straight down from above everything, you would see that the, the base of the mountain is actually closer to the sensor than the top of the mountain, but it's not being interpreted that way because of the side looking incidence angle. So radiometric terrain correction uses a digital elevation model to, to adjust for these distortions. So it, it takes the the, that mountaintop that's been moved over closer to the sensor than it should be and places it where it should be in space. At the same time, the radiometric part of the correction adjusts for that, that false brightness that you're seeing along the leading edge. Because all of those returns are being received at the same time, it's, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of scatterers that are all contributing to that signal. And because it's interpreted as being all in one place, it seems like a really bright scatterer. But in fact, those scatterers are spread over a much larger area than the sensor um, interprets. And so the digital elevation model can be used again to spread out and normalize those radiometric returns over the entire area that is actually represented in that backscatter return. So once you've done RTC, you can see in the image on the right, that the, the mountains are in place, the, radio, the radiometric measurements are, are more equalized on the front and the back side of the mountain. And at this point, you can add it into a GIS product or project or compare it to other data for analysis and things will line up. The other component of SAR data is the phase. The phase is the location of the, of the wave along its cycle when it returns to the sensor. So if there's a SAR sensor that's sending a signal out, it, it travels down to the earth, bounces off and comes back. And it, when it returns to the sensor, it's at a, a particular um, location in its wave cycle. And the sensor can measure that where it is in the wave cycle or its phase. If you orbit around the earth and come back and collect another acquisition from that same place above the earth, send out that same signal, if nothing has changed on the Earth's surface, it should come back and be in the same part of its wave cycle or the phase should be the same as it was the last time you imaged. If, however, something has happened on the Earth's surface, either there's, there's uplift, which would, which would bring the surface of the Earth closer to the sensor, the phase will be at a different point. It will, the, 
the return will be at an earlier point in the in the wave cycle when it returns to the sensor. Similarly, if it's if there's deformation that's occurred where there the surface is farther away from the sensor than it was, it will the signal will be further along in its wave cycle than it was the first time. So comparing these phase measurements uh, from repeated acquisitions is the is the basis of interferometry. And the Geo Gateway uh, tutorial later on today in this course will go a little bit more in depth into, into interferometry. But essentially, you're looking at changes in phase to identify regions where deformation has occurred. So if you create an interferogram, you can see that the, there are fringes that appear in the image. And in this image on the right of an earthquake in Ridgecrest, California back in 2019, shows that the area that was that had the highest deformation, um, you'll see that the, the fringes are very close together. So in an interferogram, if you see very narrow fringes or, or lots of bands all in one area, that indicates a region where uh, significant deformation has occurred. Whereas the, the farther apart the fringes are, the less deformation has taken place. <clears throat> 